together with UNHCR. Thank you as you change the lives of groups, of communities, of families, and individuals all the time. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señor Buticali. Eh, ahora le voy a pasar la palabra al representante del Departamento de Derecho Internacional de la Secretaría de Asuntos Jurídicos de la OEA, quien también nos va a dar unas palabras. Gracias. Gracias, Mayor Luis. Buenos días. Este, yo sé que todos están ávidos de comenzar con el curso, de manera que voy a tomar unos cinco minutos, menos de cinco minutos. Eh, me da mucho placer eh, estar acá en representación del director del departamento, Dante Negro, quien eh, por motivos eh, personales no se encuentra en la sede. Eh, junto con agradecer la presencia de los eh, distinguidos representantes y delegados y delegadas, eh, además de los panelistas y de los funcionarios de la OEA y personas interesadas en el tema, eh, como es costumbre en este tipo de actividades en que el Departamento de Derecho Internacional participa muy de cerca en la organización de los eventos, eh, nos gusta un poco explicar eh, el trabajo que hacemos en materia de promoción del derecho internacional. De manera que esa es un poco eh, la razón de mi presencia aquí. Eh, bueno, como la mayoría de ustedes saben, nosotros en el Departamento de Derecho Internacional proveemos eh, asistencia jurídica y técnica a los cuerpos políticos, pero además eh, somos eh, la entidad central de, eh, que se ocupa de la ejecución y de la puesta en marcha del de programa interamericano sobre el desarrollo del derecho internacional. Entonces, muchas veces dice la gente, bueno, acá la OEA hay, hay programas, hay resoluciones, ¿no? no se hace nada. Bueno, este es un muy buen ejemplo de una ejecución de un programa que existe y que se trabaja, programa que como ustedes saben eh, fue adoptado en el año 97 y el año pasado fue objeto de eh, enmiendas y de actualizaciones. Y de hecho este ejercicio que estamos eh, realizando en el día de hoy es el primer ejemplo, el primer ejercicio que se hace en función de esta nueva actualización del programa. De manera que eh, para nosotros es muy grato estar eh, detrás de esto, pues sabemos que eh, va a ser... Eh, eh, la presencia de los expertos en el tema en el día de hoy eh, no solamente va a contribuir a, a dar a conocer mejor el tema entre los delegados, pero también entre los funcionarios de la organización que nos toca lidiar con este tipo de, eh, de, de temas. Eh, también eh, valoramos eh, positivamente eh, el hecho de que eh, exista entre la OEA y el ACNUR un acuerdo marco. Y esa es otra expresión también de eh, elementos concretos que se hacen en la OEA. La OEA, la Secretaría General de la OEA y el ACNUR firmaron un acuerdo de eh, cooperación en el año 2007. Entonces, este es otro ejemplo, es otra ilustración de cómo se puede trabajar eh, en, en conjunto y cómo estos acuerdos tienen su ejecución. Eh, de hecho, eh, en virtud de dicho acuerdo, hemos podido organizar ya eh, cuatro eventos sobre refugiados este será el primero eh, sobre apatridia y eh, sin contar las otras actividades en materia de difusión y de promoción del derecho internacional eh, notable, notablemente el curso de derecho internacional las jornadas de derecho internacional que ACNUR eh, nos viene eh, ayudando eh, por tal motivo deseo entonces expresar al igual que lo hizo la presidenta de esta comisión nuestro agradecimiento al ACNUR por la colaboración técnica, financiera, que nuevamente nos han prestado. Eh, en nombre de mis colegas, Dante Negro, director del departamento, Diego Moreno, asesor jurídico que ha trabajado intensamente en la organización de este evento, les damos la bienvenida y eh, esperamos que puedan aprovechar al máximo este curso. Habiendo dicho esto, eh, y con la venia de la presidenta, quiero un poco eh, explicar eh, algunas cuestiones logísticas y metodológicas. Eh, en primer lugar, eh, para las personas que, eh, son, que, han, que vienen por la primera vez a la OEA, existen eh, y que necesiten interpretación, eh, tenemos disponible en la sala aparatos para que eh, los que desean hacer uso de ellos. Eh, con eh, posterioridad al curso, eh, estaremos remitiendo a los participantes eh, certificados de asistencia. Eh, para acceder a este certificado solicitamos a todos los participantes se sirvan firmar las planillas de asistencia que están en la mesa de entrada, tanto en la mañana como en la tarde. De manera que las personas que no lo han hecho ahora y que desean tener ese diplomita, es bueno que lo hayan, salgan por un minuto fuera. Marta va a estar eh, esperándoles. En eh, cuanto a la metodología del curso, estaremos teniendo dos clases en la mañana y dos clases en la tarde. Y luego de cada clase tendremos un espacio de media hora para preguntas y respuestas, eh, de manera a hacer el curso lo más dinámico posible. También informo que este curso está siendo transmitido vía webcast, eh, 
eh, con la intención de, de dar la oportunidad para que eh, aquellos que no pudieron estar presentes lo puedan ver desde la distancia. Eh, finalmente, invito a consultar nuestra página web, que es www.oas.org barra DIL, por Departamento de Derecho Internacional. Y en esa página van a encontrar eh, todo sobre el tratamiento del tema en la OEA. Y con posterioridad a este curso vamos a eh, incluir la grabación que se eh, está realizando, además de toda la documentación que sobre el mismo se eh, eh, tenga de manera que sirva de fuente de consulta. Eh, también les invito a, eh, a revisar la información que aparece en el pro, sobre el programa interamericano del cual hacía alusión. Entonces ya eh, con todo eso claro, eh, pasamos ya a materia. Eh, voy a eh, dar entonces eh, la palabra a la profesora eh, Laura Van Guas. Ella es investigadora eh, senior y gerente del programa de Apatridia una iniciativa de la Escuela de Derecho de Tilburg de los Países Bajos. Eh, se dedica a la investigación, formación y difusión del tema de la patridia y de asuntos conexos. Entre los proyectos en curso de este programa se encuentra un proyecto de investigación sobre la apatridia en el Oriente Medio, un estudio del régimen de protección de los apatridia en los uh, Países Bajos y diversas actividades de enseñanza y capacitación incluyendo un curso de verano sobre apatridia a llevarse a cabo en julio del presente año. La señora Van Guas es autora del uh, libro Nationality Matters, Statelessness Under International Law 2008, un análisis profundo del marco regulatorio internacional sobre la apatridia. Eh, ha colaborado también con el ACNUR en varios proyectos, tales como la elaboración de materiales de información para el público, el diseño y la enseñanza de cursos de capacitación. Con la venia de la Presidenta, entonces damos eh, por bienvenido a la profesora Van Guas. Gracias, eh, señor Toro. Con las palabras del señor Toro vamos a pasar entonces a la primera presentación a cargo de la doctora Van Guas. Y no quisiera eh, que inicien las presentaciones sin antes agradecer tanto a la Secretaría de la Comisión de Asuntos Jurídicos y Políticos como al Departamento de Conferencias por, la, por el apoyo que han dado a la organización del curso. Entonces, eh, con esto eh, eh, quisiera, por favor, darle la palabra a la señora Bambás. Bienvenida nuevamente. Uh, good morning, everyone. My apologies for the quick change in seats. Um, thank you very much for the kind words of introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, as was explained, I am the manager of a new initiative at Tilburg Law School in the Netherlands called the Statelessness Program. Uh, we're currently the only expertise center in the world that focuses specifically on statelessness. And one of the main reasons for our existence is to support all types of training and teaching on this very important but often neglected issue. So it's opportunities like this that uh, really get us very, very excited. Uh, so thank you very much to the organizers of this event for inviting me here. Before I start my presentation, I'd just like to point out that for those of you who have not yet seen them, there are printed copies of the presentation in both English and Spanish just outside this room. So in case you want to check any of the details afterwards, that's available. Uh, my task this morning as the first speaker is to give you a little bit of background about the issue of statelessness generally and how this is addressed through international law. Um, I hope that uh, you'll be able to, to follow some of the details and there will be plenty of time at the end of my presentation for any questions that you may have. So to...
Sorry about that. Um, so uh, let's start. Let's start by setting the scene and thinking a little bit about the problem of statelessness. Um, we will come to the question of the definition later, and I'll explain it in a little bit more detail. But very simply put, a stateless person is someone who is not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. What this means in practice is that a stateless person is someone who is a non-national everywhere. Whichever country in the world they find themselves in, whichever country in the world they are sent to, uh, wherever they travel, they are a foreigner because there is no country that is their own country where they enjoy citizenship. This is what is creating a very unique and vulnerable position for stateless people and the reason that they are of such concern for the international community. Uh, the number of people affected worldwide is believed to be around about 12 million. It's very difficult to pinpoint this exactly at the moment because there are still many gaps in the statistical coverage uh, relating to statelessness. But it's very clear that it's an issue that affects people in every single region of the world. And there are both large groups to be found in a number of countries and many individual cases of people who have fallen through the cracks of nationality laws and have been left stateless uh, and often end up floating around the world uh, slightly um, rejected in a way from society. So that's just to give you a little bit of background on the issue before we get into some of the technicalities. The first question when you come to study statelessness is what exactly then is nationality? Uh, obviously at the heart of what statelessness is, is the lack of a nationality. So we have to understand what nationality is and what it means to get a grip for the subject of statelessness. Nationality is the legal bond between a person and a state. It's a bond of membership. It tells the person that they belong, and it results in certain rights and duties for that individual towards the state. So, for instance, it's often because you are a national of a country that you have the right to vote in that country or to stand for election. There's a very clear link there. Uh, another example of a very important right that stems from nationality is the right to enter and reside in your country. So uh, whatever goes wrong, uh, whatever depressing time you've had on your holiday, there is always an opportunity to return home to your country where you enjoy nationality because you are a member of that country. At the same time, nationality can also bring duties with it. Uh, you're a member of your community, so you're expected to be loyal to that community. And if necessary, and the community is under threat, you may be asked to help defend your country. So one of the duties that is traditionally associated with nationality is the duty of military service. Um, so that's, that's the real core content of nationality. It's also important to point out, as you begin to study the subject of statelessness, that there are, in fact, two words for nationality at least in terms of international law. And so if you read publications about statelessness, you will often find the words nationality and citizenship, and they are both used interchangeably to mean the same thing. Uh, usually they both refer to this legal bond between a person and a state. However, in some national contexts, the two words can have different meanings. So nationality may be the legal bond between a person and a state, but citizenship may mean something slightly different. It may mean that you hold all of the political rights that you enjoy as a national. So it's important to be aware when you start to study issues of statelessness that there may be differences in the use of this terminology and just to check that you understand the local context when you read about reports or when you discuss the issue uh, with counterparts. So having dealt briefly with what nationality is, we really come back to the definition then of statelessness. And it's important to pause here and take a little bit of time to read it more closely. Um, it's, a, it's a very straightforward, simple sentence, but there are a few elements that it's worth explaining. So as I said, a stateless person is someone who is not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. 
This definition can be found in Article 1 of the 1954 Convention relating to the status of stateless persons. Uh, that's a convention that has been established by the international community to help protect people who are stateless, to help make sure that they enjoy rights. So the convention starts with a definition of who should benefit from this international protection. This definition has also been recognized by a number of important bodies, including the International Law Commission, as part of customary international law. The importance of that is that it means it is the internationally recognized definition for a stateless person. So even in countries that are not state parties to the 1954 Convention, this definition is relevant to the identification of stateless people and to their protection. Uh, all countries in the world have some obligations towards stateless people as part of their general human rights commitments. And so this is the definition for countries and for governments and for UNHCR and for all of you to work with. One other thing to note here is that until recently, uh, this definition has also been described as de jure statelessness. So you'll find in many of the reports that currently exist on situations of statelessness, you may find that this term is used. Basically, that is just to pinpoint the fact that we're talking about people who fall under this internationally recognized definition. Uh, it doesn't add any other further content. It's just that specification. So it's another small technicality for understanding some of the background materials. So to come to the components then of the definition, as I said, it, it appears to be a very simple sentence. For, there are a few things uh, that may cause confusion or may make actually establishing whether a person is stateless in practice a little bit more complicated. So, for instance, uh, the definition says that the person is not a national. Now, the importance here uh, is the tiny word is. It's a word that uses the present tense. So, the definition is really about understanding whether a person is a national or is not a national today, at the moment when we are testing that they are stateless or not. So, to decide whether someone is stateless, it's not relevant that they could very easily acquire a nationality tomorrow, perhaps by filling in a declaration with their uh, consular services. They are still stateless until that happens because they don't possess a nationality right now. And that's what we have to look for. Another word here is the word national. Well, I've already explained that nationality in this context refers to the legal bond between a person and a state. That's what this definition is interested in. Does the person enjoy this legal relationship with any country? Then there's the words any state. Now, in the past, this has led to some confusion because the assumption was, well, if I'm going to prove that I'm stateless, I have to prove that I am not a national of all of the 200 or so states in the world. I have to prove I'm not a national of any state. But in practice, each one of us acquires our nationality because we enjoy certain links with a country. We have links through family, maybe a, a father or a mother or a husband or a wife who is already a national. And we have links with the territory because we were born there or we've lived there for a long time. Outside of these links, you don't tend to acquire a nationality at random from another country unless you're a fantastic footballer or inventor or very rich. So in practice, when we look for which states someone may hold a nationality in, the only ones we're interested in are the states with which they have this link it's unlikely that they're going to enjoy nationality anywhere else. And this is something that we'll come back to as well this afternoon when we talk about status determination procedures for stateless people and how these should function. Then the final point in terms of the definition is the phrasing considered as a national under the operation of its law. The important point to make here is that we're not interested just in the letter of the law as it exists on paper. It's not how we would read and apply the law. If we think a person meets all the criteria for nationality under the law because they were born in a certain place at a certain time, that's fine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the state considers them 
to be a national under the law. We have to understand how the state interprets its laws and how it applies its laws in an individual case. So again, it may be that we think that a person qualifies for a nationality, but that the authorities of the state don't think that because they have a different interpretation or because there are perhaps discriminatory attitudes at play. So what we're interested in is the state's viewpoint, not our own analysis of the law. So we have to consider both the law itself and the practice that relates to that law. All of what I've just said, and a lot more detail about this definition, has now um, been written down in a very handy format for anyone who wants to understand this definition in more detail in guidelines that UNHCR issued just this week. So those are now available online, and they talk about some of the issues to do with what is nationality, what is statehood, uh, when do we know whether someone is considered as. So I recommend that that's a very good first port of call to learn a little bit more about this term and, and the use of the word stateless. Then we come to another very important point. Stateless people can also be refugees. In fact, quite often, stateless people become refugees, either because their statelessness is part of a broader campaign of discrimination and persecution, which forces them across a border, or in fact, because they've perhaps already been forced across a border and they subsequently lose their nationality. So you will see quite often that statelessness and refugeehood overlap. At the same time, not all stateless people are refugees. The majority actually are to be found in the country where they were born. They've never left that country. There is no fear of persecution. They experience human rights difficulties, certainly, but they are not refugees. In international law terms, it's possible to be a stateless person under international law and a refugee under international law. These are two separate definitions found in two separate international instruments. One is the 1954 convention relating to the status of stateless persons that I've just spoken about, and the other is the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. Now, if this is the case, in fact, the 1951 Refugee Convention offers slightly stronger protection for these individuals because it in, in, includes important guarantees like the uh, prohibition of refoulement. So someone who is both stateless and a refugee will tend to be treated first and foremost as a refugee. But it could be that they cease to be a refugee. It could be that they can return to their own country um, or that other situation, circumstances change. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they also acquire a nationality. So at that stage, the person ceases to be a refugee but may still be stateless, and so may still be someone who needs additional protection or additional assistance. Then we come to the question which really underlies why we're all sitting here today. Why is it that statelessness is an international concern? For lawyers, it's a fascinating idea that someone could not have a nationality anywhere. But that's, that's not why we're all here. We're here because it is a human issue, as has already been mentioned this morning. It's an issue that really affects people very deeply. Um, it can have a detrimental impact on individuals' lives because it makes it very difficult to access all sorts of human rights. Anything from work opportunities to education, healthcare, right the way through to contracting a marriage, buying property, registering children, acquiring a death certificate. It's a very, very long list of things that become very difficult or impossible if you have no nationality. This effect on individuals has a knock-on effect on families because if, let's say, the head of household, the breadwinner, is stateless and he or she does not have the opportunity to go and work, then the whole family can be affected by poverty or by marginalization. So it's not just the stateless individual themselves. And you'll often see, uh, fortunately not so much in this region, thanks to the Usoli principle, 
But in other areas of the world, statelessness is often passed from one generation to the next. So it can continue to affect families for, for decades. So that's how it affects individuals and the people who are directly involved. But it's become an international concern because it also affects communities more generally and it affects state interests. It can cause tension because a certain part of the population is excluded from society in a way because they're not able to participate in the same way as everyone else. So it can lead to tensions between stateless communities and the rest of the country or even within the stateless community about how to address their issue. It can also, as I mentioned, lead to forced displacement, at which stage it becomes an international issue because stateless people are forced across international borders. And it can even lead to conflict in the most extreme circumstances. So these are the, issue, the reasons that it has really become such a prominent issue on the international agenda. Because yes, it is first and foremost a human rights problem, but it's also a problem that can affect a wide range of state interests. Having said that then, the international community has been working on statelessness for some 65 or so years, uh, longer if you take into account all sorts of other instruments that were developed before then. And the international community has, very simply, two main aims. The primary aim, the ideal, is that statelessness is avoided, that we wouldn't be sitting here today because everybody enjoys a nationality. So that's one of the aims that the international community is working towards. However, as I mentioned, there are today around 12 million stateless people worldwide. So the reality is that we need this other objective, which is to make sure that stateless people are protected, so long as we have to deal with the issue of statelessness. So what I would like to do in the next few minutes is take you through how the international community has dealt with these aims. What kind of international tools has that led to? If we think of the question, how can statelessness be avoided? Then there are three steps that we really need to walk through. The first step is to understand what it is that causes statelessness. Statelessness will generally stem from some kind of issue with a state's nationality law, obviously, because someone has been unable to acquire nationality. So one of the main causes of statelessness can be gaps in a country's own nationality law or gaps or problems that lead to statelessness when two or more countries' nationality laws collide in a way. For instance, if there is no provision to grant nationality to children who have been abandoned shortly after their birth. Those children, we don't know necessarily where they were born. We certainly don't know who their parents are. So the usual way that those children would acquire nationality, it's unclear. So a gap in the nationality law would be where this situation is not dealt with, where there is no provision for granting nationality to foundlings those children would grow up without a nationality. They will be stateless. Another gap may be if there is no safeguard where the parents are stateless to make sure that the child at least acquires a nationality. At the same time, there can also be a bigger problem with nationality laws where certain individuals or groups are perhaps deliberately excluded from acquiring a nationality. This is described as arbitrary deprivation of nationality. And unfortunately, it's something that you can see in a number of countries in the world where a certain uh, religious or ethnic or racial minority has deliberately had their nationality withdrawn or is unable to access a nationality. This is something that can really create quite large situations of statelessness. Then there is also the circumstance of state succession. If states break up or a part of the state separates and becomes independent, at that stage, they need to suddenly deal with the consequences that has for the population in terms of nationality. In particular, if the original state ceases to exist, take the former Soviet Union. Once that dissolved, there was no more Soviet citizenship. It was impossible to enjoy citizenship of the Soviet Union because that no longer existed. So everyone who had that nationality 
had to acquire a nationality of one of the many new states in order for them to not be stateless. So those states have to really work together to make sure that no one falls between the cracks as each of them decides for itself who are now our citizens. So state succession can really put the pressure on in terms of forcing states to make decisions about who their nationals are. So these are kind of the principal causes of statelessness. If you uh, look at some of the situations worldwide, you'll see that a common underlying factor is discrimination of some sort discrimination against a particular ethnic or religious minority, also discrimination often against women, where women are unable to transfer nationality to their children. Their children are much more likely to become stateless. Other factors that can contribute to statelessness are uh, migration. If people move across borders, then obviously they're much more likely to become a victim of a conflict of nationality laws, or their children may. Lack of birth registration will make it very difficult to prove who your parents are and where you were born, which are the key facts under nationality law, and administrative obstacles. It may be that you can acquire a nationality by filling in some kind of paperwork, but if that paperwork is only available in a language you can't read, or if you pay $1,000 to get it, or in an office that is 2,000 kilometers away, those types of obstacles can also make it very difficult to access nationality in practice. So once you've understood what the general causes of statelessness can be, you can start to look to see whether any of those problems exist in the countries that you are interested in. So the second step is to analyze the nationality law and practice in the areas of your own interest. As I mentioned, nationality is acquired principally on the basis of one of two kinds of links, a link through family or a link through territory, which means that you are connected to the state and therefore uh, worthy of membership of the state. So the first step is to understand how these links translate into an opportunity to acquire a nationality under the law of a particular state. And then it's important to look for gaps in that law. As I mentioned already, one gap may be relating to children who have been abandoned. Another may be where there are no safeguards to prevent statelessness at birth, so to ensure that children who don't acquire any nationality still are granted a nationality. Another gap may be where the law allows you to renounce your own nationality or to have your nationality withdrawn by the state even if that means that you will become stateless. Ideally, there would be a safeguard to make sure that doesn't happen, but in many nationality laws, there, there isn't. Another gap can be gender or racial discrimination. As I've already explained, if a woman is unable to pass nationality to her children, it can be much more likely that those children become stateless. If the father is absent, or the father is stateless, or the father is unable to pass on his own nationality due to other circumstances. And another gap that may exist in the law is where there are poor or no procedural safeguards. If there is no opportunity to challenge a decision that the state has taken on your nationality, then there is no opportunity to say, hey, you withdrew my nationality, but now I'm stateless. There is no opportunity to, to say, well, I think this decision was discriminatory. So the procedural safeguards can also be very important to making sure that the nationality law is applied properly and consistently with the state's obligations. So we know what can cause statelessness. We then have to find the gaps in the nationality laws and in the practice. And then, obviously, we need to know what tools can we use in order to fill those gaps? What can we rely on? What does international law give us? So the third step is to apply relevant international standards. Generally speaking, states enjoy a large amount of freedom in deciding how to grant nationality. But international law does place certain limits on that freedom. And many of those limits are specifically to ensure that statelessness is avoided. That's what we're trying to achieve here. That's what the international community would also like to see. 
So international law sets a number of very relevant limits. These include a number of general principles of law, for instance, non-discrimination. It's a principle that also applies to the regulation of nationality. So in principle under international law, the acquisition of nationality should be an equal opportunity for everyone regardless of race, say. There are also very important standards within human rights law that we'll look at in a little bit more detail. And then there is the convention uh, that was commemorated last year, the 1961 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness, that is now 50 years old, yes, but unbelievably relevant to the challenges that we face in terms of avoiding statelessness today. So it's very good to see that it's being rediscovered uh, half a century after it was drafted. In terms of human rights law, the main uh, provision which has led to the adoption of so many standards relating to nationality is Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This article says very simply that everyone has the right to a nationality. This has been the inspiration for similar articles and other expressions of the right to a nationality in pretty much every major international human rights instrument to be adopted since 1948. That includes universal instruments, but also, very importantly, regional instruments. So for this region, we have an article relating to the right to a nationality in both the American Declaration of Human Rights and the American Convention of Human Rights. And in fact, these are very strong provisions because they not just say that everyone has the right to a nationality, which is, let's argue, a little bit vague. Which nationality does everyone have the right to? Well, the American regional system tells us that everyone has the right to the nationality of the country in which they were born if they don't acquire any other nationality. So there's a very concrete safeguard there against statelessness. And this has really put the region in such a good position to ensure that statelessness is prevented and reduced over time. Then the 1961 Convention. This instrument has been adopted specifically with the aim of avoiding statelessness. It tries to answer the question, which nationality does everyone have a right to? One of the common misunderstandings about this instrument in the past has been that it curtails the freedom of states to regulate nationality in the ways that they want in, in con, uh, conjunction with their own sovereign interests. There has been this idea that it uh, has created a sort of an international law on nationality, but that's absolutely not the case. What this instrument does is it says to states, you're free to regulate nationality however you like, but if a person would otherwise be stateless, this is when you are responsible to deal with it. So it's a very, very, very small, limited set of circumstances in which the instrument is really engaged. It does this by prescribing concrete safeguards for states to introduce into their own nationality laws as I said, where a person would otherwise be stateless. So, for example, it repeats what we already found, have found in the American human rights system. Uh, this notion that a child who is born on state territory and doesn't acquire a nationality should acquire a nationality of that state to make sure that they're not stateless. But it also talks about other types of gaps for instance, it says that no one should be allowed to renounce their only nationality. You shouldn't be allowed to voluntarily declare yourself stateless. Uh, people also shouldn't have their nationality withdrawn if that means that they're going to be left stateless, except in a number of very, very limited circumstances where perhaps state interests are stronger than the interests of the individual. So it sets a few very, very important limits for the avoidance of statelessness, but generally leaves it to states to regulate nationality however they like. The other aim of the international community is to protect stateless people as long as we have to deal with stateless people. 
So here again, we can go through three very simple steps in terms of how do we ensure that stateless people enjoy their fundamental rights. The first step is to understand the link that exists between nationality and rights. As we've already seen this morning, nationality is the legal bond of membership between a person and a state, and it's this membership that results in certain rights and duties. Now, traditionally in the past, nationality has been described as the right to have rights. You enjoy rights because you are a national somewhere. And with this, there has been a notion that the fate of stateless people is a matter of charity. If states want to extend protection to stateless people, they're well within their rights to do so, but there's no obligation. We'll see in a minute that this is certainly not the case today under contemporary international human rights law. However, before we look at the international standards, the second step is to analyze the challenges that are faced today by stateless people in practice. Now, I've already mentioned that stateless people experience a wide range of difficulties. It varies very much from one state to another, but these are just some of the challenges that they do face in countries around the world. Limited access to social and economic rights, so work, education, education, housing, health care. No travel or identity documents. These are usually issued by the country of nationality, so that makes it very difficult for stateless people to obtain documents, and that can have all sorts of practical problems as a consequence. Long-term or indefinite detention and expulsion, sometimes expulsion from state A to state B to state C and back to state A again, as countries try to figure out where someone belongs. Without a nationality, that, that's a very tricky issue. Uh, and if it's not possible to expel from state A to state B, well, then someone is often held in immigration detention for a very, very long or indefinite period of time as the state tries to work out what to do with them. Uh, this is something that we'll talk about a little bit more again this afternoon when we talk about the role of statelessness status determination and how this can help to prevent this problem. Inability to contract marriage or register births, that's often also linked at least to the possession of documents, if not to the possession of a nationality. And obviously exclusion from political processes. You have the right to vote because you're a national. If you're not a national every, anywhere, you have no right to vote anywhere. It makes it very difficult for you to uh, challenge what the state is doing and for you to try to change your situation because you can't participate in regular processes. So it's not all doom and gloom. Those are the realities that stateless people commonly face in countries around the world. But international law has developed all sorts of standards that, again, we can use as tools to try to tackle this. Today, if we ask the question, is nationality the right to have rights? Is it the foundation for the enjoyment of rights? The answer is absolutely not, definitely no. International law extends most rights to everyone, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their further status. So stateless people enjoy all of these rights, just like everyone else does, because they are still human beings. Again, there are three areas of law where we can find these rights actually asserted. Uh, general principles, like the principle of non-discrimination, can be very relevant to the treatment of stateless people. The broad body of human rights law. And now, specifically, the 1954 Convention relating to the status of stateless persons. So as we've seen, there are two international aims, and each has its own convention. The two conventions both operate to address statelessness, but in very different ways. In terms of the human rights obligations that states have, as I mentioned, these are to protect the human rights of everyone under their jurisdiction, including non-nationals. This applies to universal standards and obviously also to regional human rights standards. It means that stateless people can also rely on these before national and regional courts and commissions. All of the standards in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, apply in principle to everyone regardless of nationality. 
There are only a few very, very limited exceptions, the most important one being that international law recognizes that states can reserve political rights to citizens. International law recognizes that you may have to be a citizen in order to be entitled to vote because it's something that is so closely connected to your membership of the state. But beyond that, stateless people should enjoy all of the other human rights and in fact are becoming more and more successful at asserting these rights in various uh, forums. Then finally, there is the 1954 Convention relating to the status of stateless persons. This is an instrument that was adopted specifically with the aim in mind of protecting stateless people. As we've already seen, it is also the instrument that gives us the definition of a stateless person. So for that purpose alone, it's very important. It defines who is a stateless person and it establishes this as a legal status recognized under international law that has specific entitlements attached to it. And it then sets out a minimum level of treatment to be enjoyed by stateless people. So it says this is who a stateless person is, they now enjoy this status, and these are the rights that are attached to the status. Some of the most important articles in this convention relate to very practical issues. For instance, the 1954 convention provides for the issuance of identity and travel documents to stateless people. There is nowhere else within international law where this is specifically regulated. So this is a real advantage of the convention. If a stateless person can be provided with an identity document and a travel document, that makes their life already so much easier because in practice that is what is needed to access all sorts of services and it's obviously what is needed to travel for holidays perhaps but also for essential health care or for education opportunities or for employment. So it's very important in practice. The 1954 convention also includes a call for a facilitated naturalization for stateless people. It recognizes that ultimately we want to avoid statelessness. So although it's great to offer stateless people all of these rights for now, we want to help them acquire a nationality as soon as possible. So if there is a naturalization procedure in place, any difficulties that exist within that procedure for stateless people should be removed and it should be made as easy as possible for stateless people to naturalize because it's in their interest and it's obviously also in the international community's interest that stateless people can have their situation resolved. So that's another very important element of this convention. So that brings me to the end of this presentation for this morning. Uh, we will talk a little bit more, as I mentioned, about the 1954 Convention and how stateless people can be protected under it this afternoon when we look at status determination procedures. Um, but I'd be happy to hear of any questions that you have about some of the issues that I've already raised. Muchísimas gracias, Laura, por esa detallada presentación sobre los principios contenidos en, la en las convenciones sobre apatridia. Eh, en este momento, los participantes eh, tienen acceso a, a hacer preguntas. Para los que están fuera de la mesa principal, creo que hay un micrófono a su disposición. Y por aquí veo a alguien interesado en hacer una, una pregunta. Hello, Professor Laura Van. I have a question for you. Uh, first, I am Julio Alessandro Romagna. I am from Colombia. I'm a LLM student at American University. My question is the following. In, you mentioned that there is a link between a state and nationality, and, the, and nationality for individuals to obtain uh, recognition as a citizen of a in um, particular state, but when there is a recognition of a state by international community and 
this, those citizens travel and are abroad in another country, their situation can be different. Those conventions try to address those situations that our individual can be found in a statelessness abroad because is their country is not recognized by certain nation or by a certain nation as a state. The, the topic of a statehood, basically. y que aborda una temática eh, que ya está inscrita en la agenda de la organización y que eh, creemos importante reafirmar su importancia a través de, estas, de este tipo de actividades. Asimismo, queríamos agradecer a la doctora Van Basen su presentación y eh, realizarle una, una consulta. Usted había eh, señalado que eh, actualmente los estados... Eh, no son totalmente libres en cuanto a la definición de normas eh, sobre nacionalidad, que existen unos estándares internacionales que se han desarrollado y que fijan determinados parámetros sobre la materia. Eh, usted señaló también algunos de esos parámetros, pero quería señalarles si es que hay algo respecto a, a la no regresividad eh, sobre leyes. Me refiero, por ejemplo, a casos en que países que tengan una normativa relativamente flexible o, o benévola sobre temas de nacionalidad y que con posterioridad, eh, por X circunstancias, quieran endurecer esos marcos para eh, nacionalidad. Quisiera saber si es que hay algo al respecto, si nos podría ilustrar un poco más. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Elizabeth. Por aquí, por favor. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Enrique from the Mission of El Salvador. I have a question to Professor. Um, what happens in certain cases when on, like some countries, I have an idea, Japan, and there are in the nationality laws. You cannot be a citizen in Japan if even if you are born from a second or third generation Japanese. It's very hard because it's, the nationality is linked to the race. And what happens on, on cases like that, for example? I was wondering. Thank you very much. Gracias. Eh, la doctora Bambas va a responder estas tres preguntas y luego pasaremos una ronda de tres preguntas más. Okay. Uh, thank you for these really interesting questions. Uh, to begin with the question on statelessness and statehood, um, it, it takes us back really to the, the definition of a stateless person because that's what we have to work with. So um, I already said a few words about what this meaning of any state is. It doesn't mean you have to prove you don't have a link to every state in the world. Um, but it does mean that there needs to be a state that recognizes you as a national. Uh, what's tricky is where the statehood of a certain country is contested. Uh, I mean, the obvious case is, is Palestinian situation, but there are also a number of other contested states, uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia. So it's a very real issue. Um, for you to be a national of a state and therefore not stateless, there needs to be a state. But um, for many of these unrecognized states, there are some countries that recognize the statehood and then there are other countries that don't. So in practice, it may be that a person is recognized as a national of a state when they travel to certain places and that they are entitled to enter on the passport that that state entity provides. Um, however, if they show up in another country where the statehood is not recognized and perhaps also the, the passport is not recognized, the person would be considered to be stateless. Um, it's unfortunately a question that I can't provide one easy answer for. It comes down to how can this definition be applied and what is the specific context in which you need to apply the definition. Um, so I hope that kind of explains the mechanics of it, even if it's not a firm answer one way or another. Uh, in terms of what international law says about uh, regressive, regression of rules on nationality, this is a slightly trickier area because, um, surprisingly, 
nationality laws are being reformed all the time, everywhere. Uh, sometimes in very major ways, sometimes in quite small ways. Uh, one of the current trends, uh, particularly in Europe, say, is to make procedures for naturalization more complicated. You have to meet higher standards now in order to be allowed to acquire a nationality. Now, that could be considered a regression in a way. It's less flexible. It's less easy to acquire the nationality by naturalization. Um, but that is something that international law doesn't really say anything about. Uh, it is up to states to decide who to admit as nationals and who to leave as non-nationals. But where it does become an issue is where the regression of nationality laws may actually lead to statelessness uh, because the state has introduced all sorts of new opportunities to withdraw a person's nationality. If we link this specifically to the 1961 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness, I mentioned that this convention provides a number of situations in which a state may withdraw someone's nationality to leave them stateless. However, it may only set those conditions, and a number of them may only be set uh, or may only be implemented if they were already in the law of the state at the time that the state became a party to the convention and the state issued a declaration saying I want to keep these conditions. So somewhere down the line if the state is a party to this convention it can't suddenly decide oh you know what now I'm going to introduce these opportunities to withdraw a person's nationality even if they would become stateless. So there are situations where international law will limit the opportunity for states to introduce stricter nationality laws, but it's really in the context of the avoidance of statelessness that they, that may come up, or obviously where the more regressive laws are discriminatory because they introduce uh, discrimination on the grounds of gender, on the grounds of ethnicity. That would also be in violation of international legal standards. Uh, but beyond that, states are still pretty free to devise whichever rules they, they like. Uh, the third question related really to um, systems of nationality law where nationality is passed from parent to child. And that is, in effect, the only real opportunity to acquire a nationality. Um, for migrant populations, that can obviously be a serious problem over time. If you can be the third or fourth or fifth or sixth or tenth generation born in a country where they have those laws, you still hold your parents, no, well, your ancestors' nationality, uh, which can lead to problems in practice. The trick is, in terms of statelessness, which is our focus today, that even countries that have that system have often introduced a safeguard which allows children who would otherwise be stateless to acquire a nationality based on their birthplace. Uh, Japan is exactly an example of that. Normally you acquire Japanese nationality from your parents. However, if you're born in Japan and you don't acquire any other nationality at birth, you can acquire Japanese nationality. So that is the way that, again, we have a, a large amount of freedom left to states and then a few very small specific safeguards where people would otherwise become stateless because it's in no one's interest that that would happen. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, my question is in the uh, legal definition of a state in light of statelessness. Uh, do we count states that are only recognized by international law in this context, or do we also count states uh, that had uh, recognition by original bodies, or do we also include uh, those uh, institutions or territories that define themselves as states? So. Uh, I'll be grateful if you give me your light on that. Thanks.
Otra pregunta por aquí, por favor, José Luis. Gracias, presidente. Y también para felicitar esta iniciativa de la Secretaría de la Presidencia para tener esta charla y muchas gracias a, a la profesora. Eh, por supuesto que todo caso hipotético suele ser la aplicación concreta de la ley a temas específicos y es donde las disposiciones nacionales o internacionales comienzan a particularizarse, como usted lo ha expresado ahora. <coughs> y posiblemente el caso hipotético que voy a plantear ya haya tenido en buena parte respuesta con los comentarios que usted hizo a las preguntas anteriores. El punto sería el siguiente. Cada Estado, como usted lo dice, tiene el derecho <coughs> y la potestad de definir la nacionalidad y la ciudadanía. Aplica el concepto jurídico del ius solis o del ius sanguinis dependiendo de cuál sea la legislación interna. Un grupo de migrantes que va de un país a otro por motivos migrantes económicos, políticos, religiosos, cualquiera sea la circunstancia, llegan a un país vecino, los padres tienen la nacionalidad del país del cual provienen, al país al cual llegan no se les permite que sus hijos ni ellos mismos asuman la nacionalidad del de nuevo país al cual están llegando, se puede presentar incluso la circunstancia de que el padre del país del cual proviene, eh, se case y tenga hijos con una mujer, o si es una mujer la migrante, con un hombre de ese país, y la legislación interna no permite que esos niños sean nacionales del país en el cual están viviendo, a pesar de que la madre es nacional de ese país y a pesar de que aplicando el ius solis nace en ese territorio. Es decir, que quedan en una especie de limbo jurídico, y como usted decía, esas personas no tienen derecho a educación, no tienen acceso a salud y a otra serie de ventajas que el Estado debería proveerles. Para sus padres está clara la nacionalidad, pero para los hijos no. Se sienten nacionales del país en el cual están en ese momento, pero ese país no lo recibe porque la legislación no lo permite. No se sienten nacionales de sus países de origen, de los padres, porque es un mero referente de un sitio del cual vinieron y al cual no quieren volver. Y seguramente ese país tampoco tiene interés en traerlos de vuelta y darles una nacionalidad en un momento determinado a través del Lius Sanguinis si quisiera aplicarte, aplicársela. La pregunta sería en concreto, ¿quién habla por estas personas? El país donde están no le interesa, no aplica las leyes. El país de sus padres tampoco le interesa seguramente porque tiene ya demasiados problemas de económicos o sociales. Y en últimas, la circunstancia que les queda es... O viven ahí bajo las condiciones del estado en el cual están, o se van. ¿Cómo hacen estas personas por las cuales nadie está abogando y que difícilmente saben que pueden acudir a una instancia como la CNUR o que existen unas convenciones internacionales que los protegen? Gracias. Vamos a tomar una última pregunta y la profesora Bambás pasará a responderlas y luego pasaremos al segundo, a la segunda presentación. El doctor Plazas, de Colombia. Gracias, señor presidente. Ante todo, felicitar esa iniciativa de la Comisión de Asuntos Jurídicos y Políticos y la presencia de estos altos funcionarios de, de la ACNUR, amigos que conozco hace bastantes años y hemos tenido que lidiar y trabajar conjuntamente sobre los temas, entre otros los que se están tratando en el día de hoy. Eh, respecto al tema de la patria, si bien es cierto que en un momento dado, y no, no es tanto pregunta, es más algo de conceptual que quiero manifestar. Si bien es cierto que en un momento dado a la persona no se le da una nacionalidad, no significa que no tenga derechos. Precisamente por eso se, 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 se nace la figura de la patria y con base en eso puede desarrollar los derechos a los cuales pues tendría cualquier otra persona. Me pareció importante la claridad que hizo usted en su en su charla, en su, en su exposición, perdón, referente a que todos los apátridas, eh, los apátridas pueden ser refugiados, más no todos los refugiados tienen la calidad de apátridas. Eso es un concepto que debe quedar totalmente claro. Y por último, solamente comentar que eh, la parte de otorgar la nacionalidad o no, pues depende de, por lo general constitucionalmente como lo tengan establecido los países. 
nosotros en Colombia eh, jugamos con tres aspectos que son el, el Jus Sanguin, el Jus Soli y Jus Domicili y con dos de estos que tengo una persona se le otorga eh, la nacionalidad colombiana. Pero adicionalmente también hay un régimen especial para aquellas personas que nacen en Colombia pero son hijos de extranjeros, que tienen que cumplir una serie de requisitos. O sea, entrar a determinar cómo maneja cada país no es fácil porque son, por lo general, como dije hace un momento, regímenes que se fundamentan en las constituciones, que es la ley principal de cada Estado. Gracias. Gracias a usted. Eh, tiene la palabra la, doc la doctora Van Vaz. Um, the first question come, brings us back to this question of what do you do where there are, there are doubts about the statehood of a state. Um, I think the, the only thing that I can really add in terms of my answer from before is that in a particular context, it will often come down to the question of what is the most beneficial for the individual. Um, let's say that we have an individual from a state that is... Uh, not yet recognized broadly under international law. Um, but that state's authorities has issued a passport and the person is able to travel on that passport. Um, would it be helpful in that circumstance to say, well, in fact, uh, that isn't a passport because the government that issued it to you does not represent a state. Uh, therefore, we're not going to allow you to travel on that document. That's obviously not a beneficial situation for the person concerned. Um, on the other hand, if it's a question of whether we should be applying safeguards for this person's children to ensure that they acquire a nationality, if the only nationality available to them is the citizenship of a state that isn't recognized, Well, maybe it would be more in the interest to say, well, in those circumstances, uh, let's apply the safeguards against statelessness. So it, it's, it's tricky, again, to give a kind of a one-size-fits-all answer without having a particular situation in mind um, and knowing what it is about the individual's case and what it is about their nationality um, that we have to deal with. Um, so it would really, really depend on, on the context again, unfortunately. Uh, it's a good lawyer's answer. Um, in terms of uh, the problem of people who live outside their country of nationality, whose children acquire their nationality and um, may experience some kind of identity crisis effectively because of that. Uh, I suppose I could count myself as, as one of those people. I was born outside my parents country of nationality I've, I've never resided there um, but I hold their nationality um, in reality I myself feel connected to two different countries and in different situations I would identify myself as a member of one or the other um, this really comes down to more a question of identity uh, than of nationality strictly and uh, certainly takes us away to some extent from the question of statelessness. Now, where this creates practical problems is if the, uh, the circumstances mean that because you don't enjoy nationality in the country where you're residing, that has all sorts of consequences for your enjoyment of rights. Um, if, if that's the case, then obviously we can rely on other areas of international law Uh, it's not just stateless people that enjoy rights everywhere. It, it's, it's nationals of foreign countries as well. And we obviously also have standards relating specifically to the rights of migrant workers and their families. Uh, so it's a case of, of uh, using those parts of international law to deal with the more practical legal issues, um, while the identity question is really something for, for the individual to settle. Um, What it does provide you is a freedom to decide in a way which state you do feel attached to and an opportunity to perhaps return to your country, uh, the country of nationality of your parents, uh, if that's the culture that you feel most closely connected to. So it provides um, problems, certainly, but also opportunities in, in many cases. And it's a reality that, uh, what is it, 200 million migrants and their families worldwide currently face, and, and it's, it's an issue that, that's growing and I'm sure will be a new area of, of debate 
Um, but it, it, it takes us to some extent away from uh, the issue of statelessness, although it's very, very interesting. So thank you. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Van Bas, por su presentación. Nuevamente a ustedes por sus preguntas que, que han generado comentarios y respuestas muy interesantes por parte de la doctora Van Bas. Ahora vamos a pasar a la consideración del segundo tema del curso, que es titulado Enmiendas Pendientes de Leyes para Prevenir y Reducir la Patridia. Para el desarrollo del tema, eh, estará a cargo el doctor Mark Manley, quien, como mencioné al inicio de, del curso, es el jefe de la unidad de apatridia del Departamento de Protección Internacional del ACNUR. El doctor Mark Manley se desempeña en estas funciones desde el año 2006 y anteriormente trabajó en la oficina del ACNUR en Colombia y en la unidad jurídica regional en Costa Rica. Antes de trabajar con el ACNUR, eh, fue oficial de derechos humanos para la misión en Kosovo de la Organización para la Seguridad y la Cooperación en Europa y en la misión de verificación de derechos humanos de la ONU en Guatemala. Tiene una maestría en Derechos Humanos por la, unidad, por la Universidad de Exes en el Reino, Reino Unido. Eh, es un placer para mí otorgarle la palabra, eh, doctor Manley. Gracias, señora presidenta. Eh, es un placer para mí estar aquí el, el día de hoy y quería expresar mi beneplácito eh, a nombre de la ACNUR y a nombre propio por la iniciativa de la Comisión eh, de Asuntos Jurídicos y Políticos y además eh, expresar eh, nuestro beneplácito por el apoyo que ha recibido la resolución que dio lugar a, esta, a este evento, la resolución 2665 eh, aprobada por la Asamblea General eh, en junio del año pasado. Eh, en esta sesión vamos a entrar en un poco más de detalle eh, en cuanto al tema de la prevención y la reducción de la patridia y eh, haré algunas precisiones sobre la situación eh, en la región. Eh, el PowerPoint está en inglés, sin embargo, tenemos afuera una versión en español para los que prefieren seguir la presentación en español. Eh, yo haré el intento de, de dar la presentación en, eh, en español, eh, quizás eh, con algunas precisiones en inglés, si fue necesario. Eh, en cuanto al tema, la prevención eh, significa básicamente evitar que los casos de apatridia se presenten, evitar que la apatridia ocurra. Eso implica básicamente ver que cada niño adquiere la nacionalidad de un país al nacer y evitar que las personas que tienen una nacionalidad pierdan esa nacionalidad quedándose apatrias en el transcurso de sus vidas. La reducción de la patria en contra habla más bien de situaciones donde ya tenemos personas o poblaciones apatrias y estamos buscando una solución para, para esas personas. Y como ustedes entenderán, fundamentalmente para estos dos temas lo que tenemos que ver es lo que ocurre en las leyes de nacionalidad eh, de los países con eh, los cuales las personas tienen eh, vínculos, tal como eh, expuso la doctora Van Vaz. Vemos rápidamente la, eh, los fundamentos.
Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Bueno, eh, entonces... Eh... Ah, que eso es... Eh... Perfecto, ahora todos me escuchan. Muy bien. Eh, entonces, eh, vamos a iniciar con eh, eh, los fundamentos eh, legales de la, de la acción de la ACNUR y también eh, de la acción de los estados en materia de prevención y eh, reducción de la patria. En cuanto a la ACNUR, eh, la, la Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas ha establecido el mandato de la oficina eh, mediante una serie de resoluciones adoptadas desde el año 95 y esas resoluciones hacen hincapié sobre la asesoría técnica que tiene que brindar el ACNUR a los estados en materia de eh, leyes de nacionalidad y su implementación. Y tenemos lineamientos más detallados sobre el mismo tema del Comité Ejecutivo del ACNUR, el cual está conformado por eh, muchos de los estados aquí eh, representados. Eh, si ustedes revisan eh, la resolución 2665 eh, de eh, la Asamblea General de la OEA, verán también que hace referencia eh, al rol técnico de la ACNUR. Eh, 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 puede ser que sea necesario un receso, eh, pero hasta que me paren puede seguir. Eh, <ríe> eh, bueno, vi viendo la resolución de la OEA 2665, también verán que hace eco de lo que ha dicho eh, la Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas, porque hace referencia al rol técnico de la ACNUR en cuanto a la asesoría a los estados eh, en materia de leyes de nacionalidad. Eh, ahora, revisando bien las resoluciones tanto de la Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas como de la Asamblea General de la OEA, eh, verán que también se hace hincapié en la, el rol primordial que tienen... Cinco minutos. Termino... Ya, no hay nada de servicio. Ah, no hay servicio. Ok, perfecto. Vamos a hacer un break porque parece que ha terminado eh, la interpretación. No, no, solamente por el problema técnico. Ah, ok. Vamos a arreglar el problema técnico y volver. Así que en cinco minutos estamos de vuelta. Lamento mucho. Gracias. Disculpa.